The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Hello, and welcome to the Paul Leslie Hour. Thank you for tuning in. Before we get into the interview, I would be honored if you would consider going to thepaulleslie.com and clicking support the show. There are quite a number of things I want to accomplish with the Paul Leslie Hour, and you can help me get more of these interviews out there to the masses. It only takes a moment, and it makes a world of difference. Last but not least, tell someone about the Paul Leslie Hour. Let them know in whatever way you can. And now, let's get into the interview. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, joining the Paul Leslie Hour is a master of sound. Rob Verbroni is a record producer, audio engineer. He has contributed greatly to the world of sound production and engineering, the art and science of recording. In fact, Keith Richards wrote this about him. Rob Verboni is a genius. He is one of the best sound engineers you could ever meet. He's worked with the best artists in groups, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, the Beach Boys, Tim Harden, Bonnie Raitt, Joe Cocker, the band, Eric Clapton. He also remastered the entire Bob Marley catalog when he was vice president at Island Records. He's also known for for building and designing the Shangri-La Studios in Malibu. So, Rob, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us. You're quite welcome. You know, the last time we talked, we were talking on the cell phone, and it was a few weeks back, and something that I got from you was your passion and your excitement for sound. It really came through just in the few minutes that we talked. Yeah, well, I mean, I I really feel that, you know, forgetting making records or movies or anything like that, just how sound affects us in everyday life is very important. I mean, and you really have two things. You've got sound and you've got silence. And the two are equally important. And how they relate to each other is really important. And that especially applies to making music because silence is sort of, it's your canvas and um, what you do from there. And space is really important. I mean, in terms of three dimension, three dimensionality of sound and stuff like that, space is really important to making that a reality. And, you know, it's easy to like make a wall of sound and clog things up. Not any, I'm not saying anything negative against Phil Spector, at least as far as sound goes, but but the point is that you know it's uh it's it's a, it's a, it's an art and it's sort of an ongoing thing that you know I'm still a student at I've been doing this 55 years and I'm still a student you know that's all I can say there hmm. well as you said it's an art what has always been the purpose of the art the work that you do well i kind of started to figure this out as time went on i mean when i started out you know, I was mentored and I mean, I started on my own before I got into a professional situation. I, I set up a studio when I was 15 behind a friend's guest house and friend's parents guest house. And, and, uh, there was that, but then I got into the, you know, when I was 18, I got into the professional world of it, you know, you, and you got to kind of do what you're told in a certain respect at that point in time. But I kind of went my on my I kind of was I heard my own sort of calling and had I I kind of I had a feeling about what made me made me motivated in the situation. And I kind of followed that muse. And after about five years of producing records, I mean, I engineered for a few years and then I realized I wasn't the boss and uh, I didn't want it to be like that. So I became a producer. Right. So. I just, I didn't, right. When I started out, I, it used to say on the record supervised by the word producer wasn't used when I was growing up. Right. So I just figured that there was this, there was a band and an engineer and this guy that was a supervisor. Right. But I didn't realize how it worked. So anyway, that I eventually learned. And, but anyway, after about five years of making records, you know, producing them, I started to understand that 
there was something sort of timeless going on. And what I realized was that I was making my decisions based upon feel, not upon technical perfection. Hmm. And I didn't even know I was doing that, right? But I mean, you know, because I was there at the Village Recorder when Steely Dan did that first record. I was the chief engineer at the time. And the, the, for those first two records, I was there the whole time. And, you know, that was one of the longest, most, you know, I've never seen any kind of perfection on that level ever. I mean, you know, they used to punch you. We used to joke around. They punched in every two bars, right? I mean, it was like craziness. That's one uh, one extreme. And then the other extreme is kind of where I'm coming from, which is more about things feeling right, not being technically perfect. And I had a discussion with George Martin about this once, and I had noticed I, I had never listened to a Beatles record in the studio, but I was mixing a band album at Capitol. And one night I, it dawned on me, I thought, God, the Beatles uh, production two tracks must be in the tape library here at Capitol. So I said to the guy, you know, I asked him, he said, yeah, they're here. And could you get rubber soul and, and uh, revolver? And he brought them up and we listened to him in the control room. And I couldn't believe like the amount of things that were let go intentionally. When I got to meet George Martin and talk about this, he said, well, that was a conscious decision. He said, it was more about the emotion. He, he was saying the same thing I was kind of, or, or what I was feeling. And, so anyway, that's where I, I really kind of realized that's where I was with the whole thing. And that's why I think that sound, in as much as it affects emotion, is important. Because I don't know exactly how to answer that, because that's a really relative thing, a relative answer. It's not cut and dried. I mean, what sounds good to one person might not sound good to another. But in my opinion... When the sound is most effectively transferring the emotion of the performance, I would say that's what good sound is. But it's not sort of a qualitative thing. It's more to do with this way I'm describing it, you know. So, I mean, that's my kind of take on it. Hmm. Interesting. Wouldn't you say that for some artists, perfection can kind of become like an enemy? Sure. Well... Yes, it can. And we'll see the other thing you got nowadays with Pro Tools and all that is like, you know, knowing when to stop is a difficult thing for artists, right? <laughs> I mean, with tape, you had a built in limitation. There's only so far you could go, and that was, you hit a wall, and that was the end of the story, right? But with this, you can go on forever. And it's, I mean, Tom Dowd and I used to talk about this. It's that whole thing of knowing when to stop and, and being the producer knowing when to advise them to stop. Like, you know, you got it, let it, let it go, you know, that type of thing, which you used to do in the old days. Now it's kind of like, you know, you can just put, paint yourself into a corner or dive down into the rabbit hole. You know, I mean, it's, it's tricky on that front, right? So it's really a question of what are you trying to achieve? Right. I mean, I'm trying to achieve when I'm making a record, I'm trying to get the most out of the artist emotionally and and communicate the most of emotionally getting the songs across emotionally right that's that to me is number one on the list and the rest of it all follows right but that's number one in my opinion can you recall the first time you were in a recording studio yeah i sure can i hitchhiked to gold star and and uh, I got in there, and Phil Spector was working with, working with the Righteous Brothers. And um, somebody told me that the back door at Gold Star, it was on Santa Monica and Vine, and there was an alley behind there. And somebody told me that after 6 o'clock at night when the receptionist left, the back door was always unlocked, and you could go in the back door, and there was a little... There's a couch there, like with chrome handlebars on the right side, and a vending machine over on the left. And there were the studios were mirror images, and there was a there were two studios, and there was a hallway from the back all the way down up to Santa Monica Boulevard, straight line hallway, where the receptionist sat up there, right? So you'd sit on the couch, and then if somebody would come out of one session, they'd see you sitting there, but they they wouldn't say anything because they think you were with the other session. And then vice versa, right? But nobody was hanging out in that lounge much, just me, kind of. And they'd come out and get a cup of coffee or something. But in any event, that's where I first went. I saw the Beach Boys work there. I saw Buffalo Springfield work on some of their first record. Uh, that was my my 
first experience. And I, and I wasn't working, of course. I was just observing. I was sitting outside, just sitting outside the control and waiting for the door to open so I could just see the reels turning and the VU meters going. You know, I mean, just get a little quick glimpse every, every half an hour, and I was satisfied with that. And I eventually got invited in. Doc Siegel invited me in at one because he started to figure out that I was, you know, all these different sessions were there, and I was common to to all this, but I I couldn't have been with all the different clients. So he realized what was going on, and then he finally said, "You want to come in here and watch, right?" And then, little by little, you know, I got to watch more and more, and it was fascinating. And that was, you know, I'd already been bit because I was recording at home, but to see it done professionally was a whole other thing. And it was really interesting too because. Like those Brian Wilson sessions, there'd be 20 musicians in there, and there'd only be 10 microphones, right? I mean, you know, and that I that always stuck in my mind because when I was coming up, and the you know the mentor, the people are mentoring me, saying you know you got to put a microphone on everything, and the mics have to be close, and blah 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 blah. And it, it didn't go along with what I saw at Gold Star at all, right? And and I finally came full circle and and rediscovered that for myself because that record that Keith Richards and I did, the Timeless record that won the Grammy. That recording that I produced of his was five microphones, a stereo mic and four other mics. That's it. Five microphones on the whole thing. And I kind of got back into this thing that, and now I do that. I've been doing this now for 20 something years, you know, making records with very few microphones. It works great. I mean, it's much simpler and it's just, it's a great thing, but it's not what everybody else does pretty much. It's kind of unusual. Hmm. Well, what producer would you say you have learned the most from? Well, huh, that's a, kind of a hard question to answer, but I'd have to give you a, a number of people. I mean, I learned a certain amount from watching Phil Spector. I learned quite a bit from with Brian Wilson. I learned from George Martin. Jimmy Miller was, to me, Jimmy Miller was exactly where I was at, or I was exactly where he was at, the, a good way to say it. And so I think of all the producers that were really successful, I kind of related to him the most. I think Butch Vig's an incredibly good producer. And, you know, there's a number of others, but I mean, but those are the first ones that come to mind, you know. I mean, I like Daniel Lenoir. We're friends. And I mean, but his, he's more of a, you know, he's a producer that, you know, puts his fingerprint on everything, right? I don't work like that. I, I kind of adapt to the artist and every record I make sounds a little different. You know, there's a similarity on some levels, but there's certain producers that it's almost like the, like the, the producers, the artist and the artist is just a session musician. You know what I mean? There's <laughs> like that. Phil Spector's one of those for sure. And there's others, you know, but I'm just saying, yeah, I mean, Mutt Lang's incredible, but I mean, that's a whole, thing in and of itself and that's another thing where that's a very specific thing that you know and there's others you know but i'm just saying those are the first ones that come to mind we've talked a little bit about the beach boys and i'm hoping you can possibly tell us about the experience that you had with the holland album which is an album that a lot of people have gone back to and a lot of people have said it's a favorite including elvis costello yeah, well, that's an interesting, I mean, that was a turning point in my life because that was, you know, I did Sail on Sailor and it was the first record I ever did that got on the radio, right? I mean, well, I had one little tiny single some years before that, that, you know, got on local radio in LA, but I mean, in terms of the big deal. So the interesting thing was it was done in Holland and uh, now I mixed the California saga, the Mike Love and Al Jardine stuff. I mixed Ricky and Blondie songs. I remastered it and put my technology real feel on it, and I fixed the polarity on those other songs. What a difference. Oh, my God. All those other, there's Brian's, Carl's stuff, and Dennis's stuff. The polarities are all backwards on all on the original. Which is, there are a lot of that happened in the 70s. I mean, there's a lot of polarity issues, you know, because of the lack of standardization between the U.S. and Europe. Yeah, it's funny. A lot of people don't know this. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this in an interview, but, you know, XLR actually means something. And, you know, I've asked every producer and engineer I've ever met, what does XLR mean? Bob Clearmountain says to me, oh, XLR means ground left, right. And I said, X is ground, L is live, a British term, R is return. 
by definition, live is positive, return is minus. And that, but when they brought the connector to the United States, somebody at the AES or somewhere looked at this thing and said, okay, well, everybody agreed that pin one was ground. But then the U.S., they said, well, that pin next to ground, which is pin two, will make that minus, and that one that's down there by itself will make that plus, which happened to be exactly the opposite of the name and the design of the connector. And that's what caused all this massive confusion for 20-something years between the U.S. and the Europe and the England. Isn't that a trip? Huh, how about that? Interesting. Yeah. Al Grundy taught me that. Al Grundy was the most incredible teacher. You know, he he started the Institute of Audio Research, and I went there in 1969. Jack Douglas and Jimmy Iovine and myself were in that class, and Dennis Ferrante from the record plant as well. And, and it was the first class, you know, first school in the in the world, the first recording school in the world in 69. And Al was so brilliant, and he taught us all these amazing things, and that was one of them. Yeah, so anyway, back to the Holland record. So in any event, so the thing that was interesting was that each one of the guys, you know, everybody had their own tapes, right? So Carl had his tapes. Dennis had his tapes. Ricky and Blondie had their tapes. Brian has his tapes. And Al Jardine and Mike Love had their tapes. So there were five different factions, and it was like five different records, right? And so I worked with Ricky and Blondie first, Leaving This Town, and there were a couple of songs that we did that didn't get on this record. I loved Leaving This Town, but in any event, we got really close, and, you know, we're still really close, and I introduced Ricky Fittard to Bonnie Raitt, and he's been with her since 1981, and but this was 1972, right? So in any event, that was kind of interesting, because you ha it was like five different bands. It wasn't like one band, right? And then the, the way the Sail on Sailor happened was, Van Dyke Parks, Ray Kennedy, and Brian Wilson wrote the music, and they had a title, and that was it, right? And so Warner Brothers felt like they didn't have a single, and they got back from Holland and said, you guys got to cut another song. So there was this song, Sail on Sailor, but it was unfinished. So we went in and cut it, and then their manager, Jack Riley, ended up writing the lyrics 20 minutes before it was sung. <laughs> we Blondie Chaplin, Ricky Fattar, Jerry Beckley was involved, Carl... Wilson is pretty much them that recorded the song, played everything. And then Ricky Blondie and Carl and Jerry did background vocals. And then, but anyway, so we got, had this track and then well, there was no lyrics. And so, so Carl says to Jack Riley, Hey Jack, maybe, why don't you take a shot at writing some lyrics? Cause he sat on the piano and wrote the lyrics in 20 minutes. And that was what was used. And then Dennis showed up to visit and Carl said, hey, Dennis, we just got lyrics for Sail on Sailor. You want to sing it? And Dennis says, sure. So he goes out to the studio, and he sings the first verse and the first chorus. And then when he starts the second verse, he gets about 10 seconds into it. He said, hold it a second. And we stop. And he said, listen, guys. He said, I don't know how to say this, but, you know, I've got a board out in my car, a new board. And I, all I'm thinking about is going surfing. He said, I'll see you guys later. And he doesn't even come into the control and say goodbye. He says goodbye over the mic and goes out the back door of the studio and leaves, right? So then... Blondie's in the control room, and Carl turns around and looks at Blondie. He says, you want to try this? And so Blondie goes out and sings it, and we use the first take from the second verse to the end, and we use the second take for the first verse, and that's the vocal. <laughs> and what a vocal it is. Blondie is just amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's Yeah, no question. Yeah. Well, when we talked on the phone, uh, on the cell phone a couple weeks ago, I was telling you that there's – an album that you produced. It's, it's a special album, I think. I go back and listen to this one from Bob Dylan again and again. And I'm talking about Planet Waves. Mm. And I think we should talk about this since it's going to be his 80th birthday in just a bit. Can you possibly tell us a story from the, the making of Planet Waves? Well, sure. I mean, well, that's an, that was a big, amazing thing for me. I mean, first of all, I was so enamored with the band already, like big time enamored, you know. I mean, I dug Bob Dylan, but the respect I had for the band was a whole nother story, right? So I was kind of flipped. I, at first, I knew that Bob Dylan was coming to the studio. I didn't know the band was coming. And I almost, I was the chief engineer, and I almost gave the project to somebody else, right? And then I was, I found out the band was coming and that was the end of that. I was like, I'm doing this right. So anyway, so that I'll never forget that day when I met him, me and Robbie and Bob met in the hallway to going into the studio, be at the village. And 
And then Robbie says to me, you know, by the way, you know, Bob doesn't do vocal overdubs. All this is going to be live. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, so I thought, okay, cool. So we did the record in four days, and all the vocals were live. But, you know, the thing, the, the story that's the riveting story about that record is to me is forever young because we cut five versions of that song. Everyone completely different. We ended up putting two of them on the record. But that slow, cl that classic slow version, you know, to me is the one. But I'll never forget that. I'd never witnessed anything like that in the studio before. I mean, it was all live. What you hear is exactly what happened. There were no overdubs done whatsoever. And it was just, I was just plastered to my seat with my mouth open. I just couldn't even believe that I was witnessing this, right? And uh, the funny story about it is that they come in to hear, they only did one take. I mean, we had done it. This was the sixth time or fifth time we had done it, every time a different way. This was like a Friday afternoon at about five o'clock. And so anyway, we did this take and then they come in and there was this guy, Ken Lauber. There was a friend of theirs that played congas on it. He was kind of sitting in the corner. And the congas aren't very loud in the mix. You can kind of hear them. But anyway, so everybody comes in to hear it back. And, you know, nobody said a word. It was like literally... Not a word was uttered. We listened back to the whole thing. We listened back to the entire thing, and and suddenly everybody just disappeared. And, and, and all that was left was Ken and I, and I just said, wow, where did everybody go? He said, I don't know. So I said, well, let's take a walk. So we there's a long block there at the Village Recorder. It's like a, you know, it's a long block. It, well, it's like a quarter-mile walk if you walk all the way around the block. So really large block, right? So anyway, so we took this walk, and then we came back, and I said – you know, let's order something to eat. So we got a little food delivered. And then, and then after we got done eating, I said to Ken, let's go, let's go. I got to go hear that again. Right. So we go back in the control room and we're listening back to it. Um, I had my eyes closed and about halfway through, I could kind of feel somebody behind me and I turned around, opened my eyes and it was Bob. And I was like, where'd you come from? And he said, Oh, I went to a movie across the street. So there was a, there was an art, house uh, i forget what it's called was called it's on the tip of my tongue but anyway there was this theater across the street and so he went to the movies he you know when he everybody else left and went went their way but bob walked across the street went to a movie and came back and was hearing it back it's a couple of days later where bob and i are the only two at the studio we're putting the master reel together you pull the takes off the two inch reels and consolidate them onto reels so when you're mixing you don't have to keep changing reels right so anyway, so we were doing that, and I go to put the slow version of Forever Young on there, and Bob says, oh, we're not going to use that. And I said, what are you talking about we're not going to use that? He said, no, no, I, I decided I want to use it. I said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I'll tell you what, if you don't use this, I'm just, I, I'm, I quit right now. I quit. <laughs> and he said, what? And I said, yeah. I said, I feel that strongly about it. I said, that was one of the most incredible experiences being there when that was recorded. And, and I said, what's, a, what's this about? So he had this old friend, Lou Kemp, that, it was a, his old high school friend that was now in the wholesale fish business, and they were still in touch. He's from Minnesota. So Lou was there, and he had been in L.A. with Bob for a while. And he, there was this place on La Cienega and um, Sunset called North Beach Leather. It's a, it was a you know leather jacket store that originally was from San Francisco, right? So anyway, so they had these leather jackets and they had like antler buttons and various things. And so Bob ended up having a couple of them. You can hear he's wearing one of them on a couple of the acoustic songs. I'm playing with you can hear the buttons banging against the back of the guitar. You hear this kind of rattling sound. That's what that is. But anyway, so Lou got to started going out with this girl that worked there. And so he brings her by the studio one night. So, and it was the same night Donna Weiss and Jackie DeShannon came by this. The night they wrote Betty Davis eyes later that night, they wrote Betty Davis eyes, but Anyway, they, and you can hear the influence, actually, if you think about it. But in any event, so they're at the studio. And so this girl that Lou Kemp brought from North Beach Leather, when Forever Young was playing the slow version, he said, she says to Bob, what are you getting mushy in your old age? And so, you know, at 35 in his old age, right? <laughs> so in any event, you know, that's why he wanted to leave it off the record. And I said, well, no. You're putting it on the, you know, like we got in this argument and then he said, okay, okay. You know, so we put it on the record. But anyway, that's the most interesting part of the thing. But I mean, the, also the thing was that everything was live. And then the other thing was that 
he only had three songs written when he started that record, and he would go home from the session at night and write the songs for the next day. They had been rehearsing out in Malibu for this tour, and David Geffen's the one who suggested they made a record, and then he ended up doing a handshake deal with Bob, and those records were on those two records were on Asylum, the live record of Planet Ways. And then he screwed up and overshipped and, and, you know, really did the wrong thing. And he apologized to Bob and Bob went back to Columbia and et cetera, et cetera. But, but anyway, so the, it, the thing was that it was done in four days. I mean, we mixed it we, in three days after that. So it, was, it took like a week, you know, but that was unusual at the time. Well, it's, it's a great, great album. Oh, it is. I go back to that one all the time. It's a snapshot. It's like a real, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's two overdubs on the whole record. There's a piano overdub and there's one little background vocal overdub and that's it on the, and everything else is a hundred percent live. Nothing's overdub on the whole record. Wow. Yeah. Well, as I was mentioning at your introduction, also Joe Cocker, one of the greatest singers, I think. What did you learn from your experiences working with Joe Cocker? Well, the thing that kind of relates to the story I just told is the what how I ended up getting my first producing job. So we're doing that record, I Can Stand a Little Rain, and Jim Price is producing it. So this song, You Are So Beautiful, had been recorded. And I, I, they had worked on the record in England, and then they came to the Village Recorder and so we ended up, you know, we used about a third of the stuff they did in England and we cut a lot more stuff. And and anyway, and so I heard that song and it was fortunate that Nicky Hopkins, Hopkins played piano on it and he, he was in a, the piano was in a booth, right? So it was completely isolated. So there were drums on it and stuff like that. And I heard the song and I said to Jim, I said, man, we should take the drums off of this and we should just re-record the rest of the music, you know, and keep it really simple, put strings on it, et cetera, right? So that's what we ended up doing. Joe had sung the song, had it done a vocal in England. He'd been down to Jamaica and, and sung a vocal down there. He'd sung a vocal in New York and he'd sung vocals. There are vocals from four cities in LA, right? So I did a comp of this vocal. So I told Jim to leave the room, but Joe sat in the control room with me when I was doing it. I was sitting at the console. He was over on the right there, sitting in the chair. And just the two of us were in there and the second engineer. And so the three of us. And so anyway, and every time I'd make a choice, I'd look over at Joe. And when it got to the end of the song, there was that crack in his voice, right? And so I was a, I was very young. You know, I was like 22 or something. And uh, I didn't have that much experience. But I just thought that this crack in his voice was the embodiment of vulnerability and like really made the song work. I mean, that was just the way it hit me. That's what I felt. So I just, I picked that line and I looked over at Joe and he got this big smile, right? now. So then I, t I go get Jim Price and I said, okay, I got the comp to him, come and listen to it. So he comes in and listens to it. And he says, he says, that's great. He says, but why'd you put that crack in at the end? We can't use that. And I said, and I said, we can't use that. And I hit the console and jumped out of my seat. And I said, if we don't use that, I quit. <laughs> I was just getting to be a pattern with me, right? <laughs> so anyway, so I stormed out of the control room. And the village recorders on Butler and Santa Monica. So Butler's like the less traveled street. That's where the door is. So I walked out. I was standing in the street in Butler. It's like 8, 9 o'clock at night. And so uh, – I'm just standing out there and Joe comes out and he puts his arm around me and he says, Rob, he says, don't worry. He said, we're going to use that. And he said, not only that, he said, I want you to finish producing this record and produce my next record. And so that's what ended up happening. I ended up finishing the production of the record and then I produced his next record, which is the, how the band stuff came together. Richard T and Cornell Dupree and Steve Gadd and all them. That was, I took them to Jamaica to do that record because I wanted them to not be doing a bunch of session dates. But so anyway, that's the story behind Joe. And what I learned from Joe was just that, you know, that the guy whose heart was as big as a house and, and he was just like the most amazing guy and that he was okay as long as he drank beer. But the minute the hard liquor hit his lips, you could look at your watch and knew you had 45 seconds before he was going to slur his words. You know, it was, I mean, I, this is my initial producing. And I thought, boy, is it always like this? You know, I was like, boy, 
this is a, this is no walk in the park here, you know. But anyway, I just love Joe dearly. We became super close friends to the end of his life, and um, and like I said, that was my first production job, my first official one. And you also worked with Buckwheat Zydeco, which oh yeah, I've always felt he was just uh, such an underrated, incredible recording artist. And I'm hoping you can tell us what are your recollections of working with the great Zydeco master Buckwheat Zydeco. Well, that was a fantastic experience. You know what's really interesting is that a lot of people didn't know that one of his main instruments was the Hammond B3. And there was a – so I got Eric Clapton on, to play on Why Does Love Have to See, Be So Bad because he covered it, you know, from Derek and the Dominoes, and Eric played on it. And so then Island had a 40th birthday party or what, 25th? I can't remember which birthday party it was in London. And all these people were there, everybody you can imagine. And anyway, so – Buckwheat came because he had been signed to Island, and then they did this jam. And Eric, he ended up playing the B three. None of us even knew he played the B three, right? But anyway, and Eric was like losing his mind. He was like, "Oh my God, can this guy?" And Steve Winwood was there, and he was just going, "Oh, geez, you know." <laughs> I mean, it was like it was pretty amazing. But anyway, it's an interesting story about that because what happened was uh, this is another telling story, but. So I was with Keith in Jamaica. This is 19, I think it was 87, 86 or 87. It was in this, it was just before Jazz Fest, right? So I was down there for a week. Keith had been rehearsing for his first solo record and he had recorded the rehearsals with two mics. And we're listening to this stuff for like, I was there for a week and every day for eight hours a day, blasting loud. And I said to him, you know, I said, you're going to have a really hard time getting this good of a sound in your record as you're getting with these two mics. I said, you mark my words. I said, it's, there's something special about this. And he kind of got what I meant. Anyway, so this was this went on for a week. So I left and I went to New Orleans because Jazz Fest was happening. I was vice president of Island at the time. And so anyway, I get there and I called Blackwell and I said, Chris, I'm here. You know, he says, great. He said, listen, he said, would you meet me? at South Lake Studios in Metairie tomorrow. He said, I'm doing a record with Buckwheat Zydeco. And I was wondering if you would help, right? So this guy, Ted Fox, that was a writer, he'd never produced a record in his life, went to Chris and said, you know, this guy's amazing and very under acknowledged. And he said, would you be interested in doing a record with him? And so I said, sure. I mean, he said, sure. And so he wanted Ted to co-produce it, but Ted didn't know anything about producing records, right? So anyway, I go down there, and so we have this meeting with the guy. Now, Chris's plan was to do this record in two days, record it one day, mix it the next day. It's pretty intense. So anyway, the guy that owned the studio, he almost fainted when they told him that, and I kind of, he all the blood ran out of his face. I went and put my arm around him and said, hey, man, don't worry about it. I'll help you. <laughs> anyway, so that. So then, so I come back the next day to start the thing, and I said to Chris, listen, I've been listening to these tapes that were done with two microphones in a in a studio, these rehearsal tapes, and I said, I want to try something. I said, let's set up the session like you normally would with a bunch of microphones, but let me take two mics and have them play for like a half hour, 45 minutes, and let me move these two mics around the room till I find the sweet spots for them. And let's record these two mics along with everything else. He said, sure, right? So we do that. Now, the whole time, I didn't really think about this because I wasn't what I was interested in, but they didn't wear headphones while they did this, right? So I'm getting these mics, and I finally said, okay, I got it, right? So then, okay, so we said, okay, we can start recording. So unbeknownst to me, they all put on headphones and – um started to go and we got about 90 seconds into it. Chris looks at me and says, says, stop it. Stop for a second. He says, he says, something's wrong. And this doesn't feel at all the same. And I said, really? And because I wasn't really paying attention to that. I was listening to sound, you know? And so he says, yeah, it doesn't feel the same. And, I, and he said, what happened? And I said, well, I said, they're wearing headphones. Were they wearing headphones when I was doing that test? No. I said, well, let's have them take the headphones off and play again and see what happens. They take off the headphones and everything's back to where it was. And he was, and it was like, Whoa, that's interesting. So I said, well, let's do it without headphones. I said, let's set a couple of speakers out there as a little PA so they can hear Buckwheat singing. And so we ended up doing that. We ended up recording the whole record in one day. And then that night when I was laying in bed to go to sleep, 
I was thinking to myself, what the heck happened there today, right? And I was thinking about it. I was thinking about the fact that sound travels a, a millisecond per foot. So in other words, when the drummer hits the snare drum, if the bass player is sitting 10 feet away from it, it takes 10 milliseconds for that snare drum to get to the bass player's ear. Now, when people are wearing headphones, they're he hearing everything at the exact same moment as though they were on the drummer's shoulders, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not reality. And then when you're on stage, that's not reality. And that's just not how it normally works. Now, if you're a really experienced session musician, like say you're in the wrecking crew or something, and believe me, they never had this conversation, but they'd listen back to something. They'd say, oh, I'm a little too on top of the beat. And they would just make up for it. And they just learned this by second nature. But there were a few guys in Buckwheat's band that were young and didn't have a lot of experience. Lee Allen was the bass player. He was amazing. And, you know, he knew this kind of stuff, but they didn't all know that. Anyway, so that's what happened. And then I, from that point forward, I quit using headphones because I realized how much difference it made. And um, so that was an interesting experience on that. And then we mixed the whole record the next day. And what I did was I put those two mics up and then I would fill the sound in with the close mics and it sounded amazing. I was able to mix it really quick, mix the whole record in a day. And then funny thing happened. So I get to know Dan Pritzker who wanted to be an intern for Blackwell at Island and his family on the high owns the Hyatts, right? He gets, comes to Island and you know, we get to, Chris puts me together with him and I, I, we spend a lot of time together and stuff. So I'm in LA at, and Dan's got a, got his suite at the riot house and, in Hollywood and so West Hollywood. And so anyway, I go there to visit him. And so one night and he said, Oh, I invited this friend of mine over Ed Turney. And I said, cool. You know, so Ed shows up, we'd never met before. This was like, I'm saying this is probably, like I said, it's either 86 or 87. I can't remember one of the two, but anyway, so, um, so Ed walks in and he says, Rob, he says, great to meet you. He said, you know, I'm mixing this Ry Cooter record, and he said, and we're using one of the records you did as a as a reference. And I said, really? I said, what record's that? And he said, Buckley Exotico on a night like this. And I said, really? Hmm. I said, how long are you, are you, have you been mixing that Ry Cooter record? He said, you know, a couple of weeks. I said, really? I said, guess what? That record you're using as a reference was mixed in one day. <laughs> and he, what? I mean, you know. You can imagine. He was shocked, right? So, and so that was that. And we had a great night, you know, chatting about all this stuff and whatever it was. So now it's like, I don't know, three months, two months later, and I get a call from Bonnie Ray, and she says to me, Rob, she said, I've got Don Was on the phone with me, and he's going to produce my next record. We're trying to find an engineer. And she said, Do you have any ideas? And so I said, Well, I said, you know, I'm going to need some time to think about this. And I and we talked a little bit more. And just before we were going to hang up, I said, wait a second. I said, I got an idea. I said, and I told the story, them the story of the meeting Ed. And I said, you know what? I never worked with this guy, but we had a really great few hours of chat that night and about all kinds of cool stuff. And I said, I just get the vibe this guy would be the right chemistry for you guys. And then look what ended up happening. So. They ended up calling him, and then he ended up working with Don Was for years, and it was all because of that. And it goes all goes back to Buckwheat Zydeco. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Rob, has there has there been an artist that you always have wanted to work with that you haven't yet? Well, no. Well, there's some. You know, I mean, Richard Thompson, I totally adore. And I met him, and I would have liked to work. And I got to work with John Martin, who I really loved, too. And that was fortunate because he was on island. I mean, any of the other ones I might think of are probably not alive. I mean, there's not many that are alive that I can think of right now. I think one of the greatest gifts I ever got was doing Native Dancer with Wayne Shorter and Milton Nascimento. That, that was probably the highlight of my life in a certain way recording session wise i mean one of them i've had a lot though that's the problem i've had i've been really fortunate you know i've had such a very wide palette of people i've worked with and a lot of them really important and a lot of them even knew each other too which was interesting but you know that richard thompson is the first one that comes to mind because i have so much respect for him 
I mean, I like people like the Black Pumas and, you know, there's some new acts that I really like, you know, Black Pumas especially come to mind. I love the heavy. I don't even know if they're still together, but I almost did a record with them, but I think they split up, but they, I love them. I mean, I just couldn't believe that when they came out. I was just like, whoa, these guys are amazing. Mine and Curtis Mayfield a little bit and stuff like that. You know, I mean, I got, I mean, one of my greatest desires from the early days was to work with the Stones and I got to do that and got to be really close with Keith and everything, which was really great and got to do that. And then I got to work with the band, which was probably the most important thing of all to me at that point in my life. And I spent years with them. And the last waltz was really a big deal. I mean, that was 18 months of seven day a week work, you know, the post-production of that thing. So that was a big thing. And it was great work with Marty. But um, yeah, but I can't think of anybody else off the top of my head that really, I mean, I wish I'd worked with Aretha, you know. I mean, I could tell you a lot of people I wish I'd worked with that aren't alive, you know, but that's kind of irrelevant right now. But, you know, I I just feel so blessed that I got to work with such a great cross-section of people that, you know, most of who I was really big fans with, of, you know. And the Wayne Shorter thing was kind of an interesting, fascinating surprise with that, how that worked out. It was Herbie Hancock and Ierto and all these amazing musicians and Milton, let alone Milton, who was... This was, what, 76 or something. He was selling out soccer stadiums in Brazil at that point. You know, 50,000 people building huge, huge. And then Wayne, of course, golly. I mean, I I don't know. In my mind, I think Wayne's one of the greatest musicians I've ever worked with in my life, for real. Hmm. What would you say, having worked with him, is the greatest talent that Wayne Shorter possesses? Well, he's a visionary, but I mean... I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, well, there's another thing to, things to point out there. I mean, when you look at him coming up through the ranks and all the people he played with, you know, from Coltrane to Miles to all these people. And so, you know, there's all of that, which is amazing, and the whole evolution of that, which is amazing. But then the, here's the thing that's really interesting, which I'd never seen in my life before. So when we did this record, he had this discipline that he was into. You know, he's a Nishan Shoshu Buddhist, like so is Tina Turner and Herbie. And and what, he's been into that for years and years and years. But anyway, so I don't know what this all came out of, but he decided he was going to only allow himself one take, right? So half of that record, he played live on the tracks. And the other half, he did overdubs, right? So he just, all the, the songs that he played live on, we only did one take of each of those songs. And fortunately, everybody was up to the task, and it was amazing, so we didn't need more than one take. But then I was thinking that, well, the overdubs, I said, that's a different story. You know, he's going to do more than one take on the overdubs, but guess what? Nope. One take. So I'd never seen that before. I mean, it was just like predetermined. He said, that's it. I only allow myself one take. So he had to really deliver right out of the box. It's a lot of pressure to put yourself under, under, but... He surely pulled it off. So I'd never seen anything like that before. And then he was just, he's just, hes a complete space cadet. I mean, the you know, Albert, he, he went to the University of Southern Illinois, and Albert Einstein was one of his teachers. And, like, you know, there's all these interesting stories about Wayne. I mean, he's really, like, you know, he's he, hes a, you know, he, he, he's got an extra dimension going on more than most. I mean, hes he's, like, you know. He's got a fourth dimensional aspect that's very vital and, you know, like unusually so. There's people that have that, but he really has it. I mean, so there's, you know, it's fascinating to me. I don't really understand a lot of it, but I can sure feel it and I can sure witness it and tell, you know, this is no, this is no hallucination. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, aside from just the talent of a person, is there something that you look for? in somebody you collaborate with? Is there something you look for in the people that you work with? Well, you hope for openness, right? You hope for, you know, it's sort of like when I was working with Eric Clapton on No Reason to Cry, you know, at one point we were sequencing the record and I said to Eric, I said, he said, Rob, you could just sequence it. I said, well, no, no, it's your record. He said, no, no, no. He said, it's our record, right? And so when you work with somebody that takes that sort of attitude, it really makes a huge difference. I mean, you know, and that's not always the case, but that's really, 
at the end of the day, really an important thing. And, and so, you know, it's, I mean, it's always different and, and you got to really, you got, you cannot refer to the past when you work it with somebody, you can't compare things to what you did previously because it's so different and you really have to step into each situation as though you're doing this for the first time. I mean, if you're going to do it right, I mean, that's what you need to do. And it's like, so that kind of, you know, if you look at it from that lens, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, it's just, it, it, you just, you get presented with the situation and you try to figure out if you've got good enough chemistry with the person, you could tell right away. I mean, I've, I, I don't, I mean, I'd say maybe there was one record in my life and I'm not going to name it that I felt like it wasn't what I'd hoped it would be, but there's literally only one. And I mean, and that's pretty unbelievable. If you ask me, I mean, I feel very, very lucky on that front, but you, but if you, if the chemistry is not right, you could tell, and it's better to nip it in the bud right in the beginning than torture yourself and the artist. Right. But fortunately I've never had to do that or send anybody home or anything, you know, in hiring bands and stuff like that. But it does happen quite a bit. It's funny, you know, when I made records with Jim Price, I, you know, when he was producing and I was engineering, I never made a record with him where there wasn't bloodshed in the studio. <laughs> I mean, where, where there wasn't a fist fight and people were bleeding. I mean, literally, like every single record, right? I mean, it was kind of unbelievable. Wow. I mean, you know, so I mean, it's all, it's a big wide range of situations. And, uh, you know, I used to work with Richard Perry quite a bit at, when he worked at the village and he was doing Leo Sayer and, I don't know, other people like that. But, I mean, that was an interesting experience. I, I mean, I learned from it because I was an engineer and watching hit the production thing. But, you know, I mean, he was good for sure. I mean, it's 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 just everybody's so different. And it's really about the chemistry between people because it's sort of like when Gled Ballard did that first Alanis Morissette record. And, you know, this they – it was like people thought this guy landed from Mars and he was the solution to producing records for the rest of the of time, you know? And so capital gives him a record deal and all that. And it all went nowhere. I mean, it was just, he had, the, he was in the right place at the right time, had the perfect chemistry with Alanis Morissette and they made this amazing record, but it never happened again, you know? And that's the thing with all this. When I was working at Island, I wasn't in the A&R department. I was just vice president, but I, part of my deal was to, help match up producers with artists and stuff like that. And um, I initiated this policy everybody hated me for, which was that I made, you know, people sign a contract to do a whole record, but I'd make them produce three songs and let us decide if we liked the way it was going. And we had the option to pull the plug after three songs, right? Hmm. Rather than make wrong decision and get, you know, everybody hated me for that. You know, I was like, I didn't make many friends on that front, but it was a good thing to do actually. And it, it often saved a lot of money, but like, cause the Melissa Etheridge record, that's, it came out of that because I was the executive producer of that record. And I was saying to Chris, you know, this, this situation is right. The producer's not right. This isn't right. And, he's, and, he's, and the manager's saying, no, this is right. And, and Chris is saying, oh, just let it go, let it go. And he keeps saying, let it go. And I keep saying, let's pull the plug. And he keeps saying, let it go. And it got to the end. And when he heard the finished record, he said, I hate this. And I said, well, I've been trying to tell you this the whole time. So we shelved the $175,000 record. It's kind of like what Joe Crow did with A&M under a little bit different circumstances. But in any event, and then he looks at me and says, what do we do now? And I, and we had done some demos with the day, the day after we met Melissa at the, playing at this lesbian club in Pasadena. I took her in the studio with Bonnie Raitt's band, and we cut a bunch of 13 songs to a two-track in a few hours. And I had that cassette with me, and we listened to it next to this record that just was made was way better. So I said to Chris, let's just get her and a drummer and a bass player to go in and record this thing live, and we'll get Waddy Wachtel to put some electric guitars on it here and there and get a keyboard player here and there, and that's the record. And that's what we did, and that's the one that came out that was a big hit. you know. But, you know, it's just, it's always different. Well, what is on the horizon with you? What's, what's, what's the latest thing? Well, I'm trying to get this technology out in the marketplace, real feel. That's the biggest thing. I mean, I've been working on this for 25 years, and what it does is make digital feel like analog. Not sound like analog, feel like analog, right? Because digital is pretty much an emotional roadblock. 
It's not so much about sound. Everybody's on the sound bent, you know. Everybody's talking about the symptoms that are caused by digital, but it's not that. It's it's the it's not the symptoms. It's the cause, and the cause is the fact that digital audio and fluorescent lights have the same effect on the central nervous system. And the reason that that's the case is because the fluorescent lights are flashing on and off 120 times a second. And that stopping and starting thing, the brain doesn't like, the subconscious, whatever the aspect of the brain, the primordial brain does not like. Digital audio is flashing on and off 44,000 times a second. At the highest resolution, it's 10 million times a second. But still, those gaps, no matter how small they are, are the issue. So it became a matter of figuring out how to make it continuous like analog, which I did figure out, but it took 25 years. And now we got to figure out how to how we're going to roll it into the marketplace because the horizon has changed constantly. You know, originally it was downloading files. We were talking to Amazon and Apple and various people about, you know, selling stuff, adding the nickel or adding the dime to the cost of the download and us getting the nickel, them getting the nickel kind of thing. And then we went through all these conversations. Then we ended up with streaming. Now that's a whole nother ball game. And we had to rewrite all the code in Linux because all the streaming services are use Linux. And so, Anyway, so it's been a moving target, you know, and um, but that's really my biggest goal is to get that out there because it really makes a huge difference. I mean, it's just emotionally, feel wise, it's it really makes a difference. And that's to me the most important part. So anyway, that's that's really it. I mean, I'm 70, you know, I mean, it's not like, uh, you know, most people are well retired at this point, but I'm never going to retire. I mean, it's like I, I just, you know. Well, as long as you got something to do, you stay alive as long as you're healthy enough, you know. So I just still am driven by all this. I want to educate people because Robert Palmer once said to me, we were at a zoo in Nassau, and our kids were like, my kids that are like 28 and 30 were like, you know, six, seven years old. Kids the same age. We go to the zoo, Robert and I, and the wives stay home, and we're at this exhibit, and there's a thing. There's like this skull up there with the little horns on it, and it says vanishing breed. And Robert points up at the sign. He says, see that? That's you and me. Hmm. And he said, and then he says, you've got to do something about this. Not we've got to do You've got to do something about this, right? So he ends up passing away. Anyway, but I feel a responsibility to that because I think that it's important to keep the the techniques that it, that that go so far back with recording that are getting lost alive. And that's really a big part of what I'm into is that is educating people and, t- you know, and I've worked with a lot of these guys. Like I have this incredible engineer friend named Big Bill Sullivan that worked with Kanye and Kid Cudi. He works with Kid Cudi now and the guy's just bloody brilliant. But especially on computers and stuff, when he worked with me, and he didn't know anything about using microphones. Right. So we he assisted me on this session. He engineered this session for me. That was all just old school recording with microphones and stuff. He had never seen anything like this before. And it just blew his mind. It was like, and I realized that there's so many people like him that they don't have a clue where to put a microphone on an acoustic instrument. It's all samples and various things and maybe recording vocals, but that's it. So I feel like there's a a big responsibility to educate people and to try to keep this thing alive. I don't say it's going to, take over or anything but things do go in cycles and it is on the upswing right now and so that's i feel a responsibility towards that well i want everyone who's interested if you want to check out the website it's robforboni.com that's f-r-a-b-o-n-i and you can check that out i always like to end the show as a kind of a, a an open an open canvas so you can go anywhere you want with this, not just limited to music or production. What would you say to anybody who's tuned in with us? Well, wait, first thing I got to say is the website is in dire need of an update. So I just want to qualify <laughs> that. Anyway, so I got that out. So I would say, okay, I think the most important thing is to, to, to if you're going to get into this business, if you're listening to this, you're probably interested in the subject, obviously, right? Okay, so I would think that the most important thing would be to try to figure out your place in the situation. In other words, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to become 
Jay Z or or Dr. Dre or are you trying to become Bob Dylan or George Martin or whatever the hell you're trying to do? I said I I would say that first of all you got to kind of figure out what's motivating me. Why am I doing this? What am I trying to get out of this? Right? And I mean I think that that's really important. And I think that once you got that straight, then I think there's a much better chance that you're going to be able to um, kind of get your self focused on the right aspect of all this because there's so many different areas to consider and you just I mean at the end of the day you really you just want to make a difference I mean you just want to leave something behind I mean I feel very grateful in my life that unlike a lot of people in life I've gotten to leave something behind something significant and that's I feel so blessed and grateful for that I can't even explain it right I mean I just I followed the muse and I uh, you know it's uh, Ken Kesey from the Merry Pranksters said one of the greatest things of all time. And he said, put your good where it'll do the most. Right. And that's exactly what I'm saying here. In other words, you try to understand what your aptitude is, whether it being a musician or being a coach or be, you know, a psychologist, you know, like that's kind of a producer's a cross between a coach and a psychologist, right. Or, you know, an engineer, whatever it is, like you, you figure out where's your aptitude? Like what is, what are you most comfortable with? If you're, if you're feeling out of sorts when you're trying to do something and you're trying to force yourself in a certain direction, that's probably not going to work out. But if you just sort of quiet down, quiet your mind down and let it come to you, you'll get a sense of that. And that's what I would chase in the situation. I mean, I think chasing commercial success is, is not a good idea whatsoever because by the t if you try to emulate somebody by the time you get figured out what they're it's sort of like what happened with prince you know like prince was so fast moving and stuff he would do something everybody go oh this is the greatest thing and try to emulate it by the time they got out their their sort of quote unquote copy of what prince did he was already onto something new so they were already always six months behind right so the thing is with this is sort of like you can't I mean, if that's your goal, it's sort of good luck. But if you just try to excel at what you, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not being religious here, but I'm saying you sort of like pray for guidance. It's sort of like, show me the way you're talking to the universe. It's like, where can I lend the most here? Like Ken Kesey said, put your goodwill to do the most, right? And so that's really what I would say. And I mean, that's not very specific, but. It's. It, I think it's true anyway. Is it, I mean, you think that's a good enough answer, or what do you think? Hey, I think absolutely, and that doesn't apply just to people who want to produce records or or write songs. Well, I say everything. Yeah, it's everything. If you're a chef, if you're a car salesman, whatever the heck it is, it's like that. See, the thing is, that it's a square peg, round hole thing. It's like you know what you don't want to do is be a square peg in a round hole. You don't want to like set your sights on something that you don't have an aptitude for or force yourself into a situation because you think that somebody else is doing this and you'd like to be them. And that, you know what I mean? You got to just be honest with yourself and say, Hey, what is it that, what is it that excites me? What is it that I feel the most comfortable with? What is it that I seem to have the greatest aptitude for? And that I say is the starting path to follow. I don't say that you always got to just you know, you come up against challenges and that you always learn from them. But the biggest thing is that, you know, what I've learned is at 70 years old is that, you know, I'm, I've been doing this 55 years and I am still totally a student. I mean, I am, I don't feel like I know anything. I mean, I know a certain amount, but the more I learn, the more I realize how little I know. Right. And the thing is that if that's your place and if you don't block things by having an attitude thinking, man, I know everything now. I, I'm, I got it. You know, I mean, boy, that's a dangerous, a dangerous place to be in my opinion. I mean, you've got to really just say, Hey, show me, show me, show me, you know, because it's all, there's always some differences and there's always some new things to learn. And that's the beauty of doing this work. Let's face it. They, the last thing it could be is boring is because <laughs> You're always learning something. I mean, what a gift that is. I mean, when people say that they're bored, it fascinates me. I'm thinking, God, I should be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get bored. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I wish, you know, well, not really, but you know what I mean? I know. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, I just, it's, I'm just trying to encourage people to be themselves and follow their heart. 
and 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 like and really you know be honest with yourself and say you know am I trying to force myself onto something or is this what I really have an aptitude for? I mean, and it's and it, it's not a mathematical or a intellectual deduction. It's more of an instinctive deduction. It's sort of like you know, it's like you quiet like mom. My mom was psychic and she used to always say to me, you know, what the trick is quieting your mind down. It was sort of like she was saying meditating. She's an old Italian, right? But Quiet your mind down. She said, everybody's minds are too noisy. She said, quiet your mind down. There's all this information out there you can pick up on, but with a noisy mind, you'll never hear it, right? And that's exactly the case here. It's like you've got to just trust your instincts and go deep into yourself and try to figure out, you know, you know what's going to make me happy. It's sort of like when, you know, think about people doing contracts with each other. It's sort of like, you got two people that are trying to negotiate a deal. I mean, what at the end of the day, what are we really talking about? You're talking about that the one person saying to the other, what's going to make you happy? And the other person saying to the other person, what's going to make you happy? And so you try to arrive at a place where you're both, you know, maybe you've had to make compromises, but you're both basically happy with where you landed, right? And it's the same kind of thing between you and the universe or you and other people you deal with. It's sort of like, What's going to take to make you happy? What's going to take to make me happy type of thing? And that's not forced. And it's not, it doesn't, it's, there's no arm twisting involved. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just kind of like being open to what comes. And I mean, and, and the, and the universe will lead the way. I can say this from experience. I mean, I'm blessed, you know, and I'm, I'm not blessed because I've born some kind of a genius. I'm, I'm blessed because I'm trying to be as conscious as possible and pay attention to everything going on around me and not have preconceived notions about things and not judge people. I mean, that's so important. But then again, this isn't a religion and I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do here, but I'm just, these are my suggestions. Well, Rob, I do appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us. Thank you for spending time with us. And Paul, please send me a link to this. Absolutely. Because I'm doing a book, you know, and like, and that's a really fascinating thing because I was laying in bed last night and I was thinking about this and I was saying, you know, the book that blows my mind. Are you familiar? Have you ever read Movable Feast, Hemingway's book? Yes, I have, actually. Well, and that the beauty of that book is, you know, it's placed in Paris in the 20s and 30s and, you know, Gertrude Stein and Picasso and all of them. And, you know, and it's like, but the thing about it that's beautiful is that he always leaves a bit of mystery going on. And it's like... You know, these producers' books, you read it, and you're done with it, and you just want to toss it in the fireplace. You'll never read it again, right? But Movable Feast, you get into the third chapter, and you find yourself referring back to the first chapter, and you're do, you're interacting with the book the whole way through it. And when you get to the end, you just want to start reading it again, right? So I'm trying to figure out how to do that. I'm also trying to figure out how to, like, couch the thing. In other words, everything about life is about perspectives, right? So another, let me explain what I mean in a simple explanation. So you say you got this house, right? So you got this house and you got one, and it's just, let's just say it's a rectangular box, right? So one side of it's painted blue, one's red, one's yellow, one's green, right? So you stand these four people where they can only see the one side of the house where they're standing. You ask each one of them, what color is the house, right? Well, each person has a different answer, right? Because from where they're standing, from their perspective, that's what color it is, right? But then imagine if you've got a high enough aerial view and you say, wow, this, this house is no one color, it's four colors, right? And so that's what I mean about perspective. I mean, in other words, it's like how I'm trying to figure out what perspective I'm going to tell this story from because you don't want it to be some boring, self serving story about I did this, I did that, and all that kind of horseshit. I mean, that's like, who wants to hear that crap, right? So it's like, it's very difficult to kind of figure out how to, I've got a great co-writer, Clinton Halen. I don't know if you know who he is, but he writes the Bob Dylan books and he's, he wrote Behind the Shades. That's how we met. So he's going to do the book with me. But anyway, I've got to do this book, you know, because I waited a long time till I'm 70. You know, Keith said to me, he said, yeah, I, I'd wait as long as you can. He says, but, you know, he, and he said to me, when he did life, he said to me, I think it's about time for you to start going for it, right? <laughs> and so, although he's eight years older than me, but I'm just saying, anyway, so, you know, that's where I am with all this. I mean, I'm just trying to do the right thing and figure out, you know, but these stories are important. 
just trying to share this knowledge. I'm going to do two different books. I'm going to do a book that's sort of a memoir like Movable Feast, and then I'm going to do another book that's sort of a technical, like a college textbook, production and engineering. And I'm not going to get into that in the other book, you know, because that's going to it's going to blow people, you know, turn people off or just go over their heads. So I think two different, that's what I've been told, like two different books are the answer, right? So that's what I'm going to probably do. Well, you're in good hands with Clinton. Yeah, good. You know who he is. Yeah, he's fantastic. I love Clinton. We're really good friends. So it's great. All right. Glad you said. Well, yeah. We look forward to that. Thanks, Paul. Hey, my pleasure. It's really, I, I love your questions. I love your tone of voice. I love your compassion. I love Everything about talking to you has been really a good experience. You know, I mean, you can tell a lot by people, you know, when you do these things. And so I feel really honored to have done this with you. And I, and I, I mean, I, I could tell that you're just that guy talking to you on the phone, which is really a wonderful thing. So thank you again. Well, that's a big compliment. Thank you. You bet. All right. All right, my dear. Keep me apprised. Um, anytime you want to talk about anything, any other questions, whatever, just call me. I'm there. Beautiful. I appreciate that. Okay, you bet. All right. Till next time. All right, man. Goodbye.